Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my studio workshop series. In this episode we're going to look at how I recorded and arranged the song Power Run, originally made by Laser Dancer. So this is going to be a practical and more detailed example of how I mix before I record. If you haven't done so, I would suggest you to watch my previous video. In that video I'm explaining how all this setup is connected in my studio and how it works basically. So check that out first and then come back to this video. This song is part of my new album, The Synthesizer Legends Volume 1. Uh, for that particular album I picked songs that I thought were legendary in one or another way. And this particular song I think is a really a, a legendary uh, Italo disco or perhaps a space synth song. And uh, I, that's why I really wanted to have it as part of the album. So for this album I'm using only analog synthesizers and analog drum machines. Uh, the reason for that is that I've always used only analog synths and analog drum machines for my studio albums. Uh, it started out with being kind of a challenge that I wanted to see uh, can I do an album using only analog synths and uh, uh, what will it sound like and then I, I kind of just continued to explore that path because I realized that wow there is many things that I didn't know that I could uh, do with an analog synth. Uh, so I'm still on that journey and I wanted to uh, uh, make this album also using only analog synthesizers. But to help me I have a digital mixer. I also have a digital audio workstation, a door, Cubase for controlling my synths and also for recording the final results. But uh, essentially what I do is I uh, arrange everything in MIDI first and uh, play the songs in real time, mix it in real time uh, using the digital mixer and first when the song is ready then I record it. So let's see uh, how I do that. So what I start with is that I take uh, the versions that I, I, I'm interested in into Cubase and uh, then I uh, literally break them down into parts. So what I've done is that I've uh, colored the different sections of the song. So I kind of I try to identify the different sections and then I give them uh, uh, their own color and I'm also writing down legends uh, markers uh, next to each section so I can see how the song is built up. So uh, with this one I realized there are two different versions out there. One is a 12 inch single version and one is uh, the album version. And I was mainly familiar with the album version and I realized the, si the single version sounded perhaps a bit more like a demo uh, because the album version sounds more finished. Uh, um, but uh, the single version is a bit longer and uh, uh, it is more beat driven. So the, the beat really feels a bit stronger in the, in the single version uh, probably because the single version feels kind of a bit scaled down uh, so it's not as there is not that much like reverb and delays and the sounds are not as full as on the album version which makes leaves more room for the drums I would say and there is also an interesting section in the end of the song where the uh, where the chord structure uh, uh, basically kind of a new uh, uh, section comes in and I wanted to take that also into, the, uh, into my version of the song. So, where to start? Beginnings are the most difficult ones for me. So I tend to start with something that is easy for me or that comes natural to me. Uh, but I also try to start with something that is relevant for the song because uh, I don't want to be in a situation where I build up uh, kind of everything in the song uh, but leave out something important and then when I come to an important element I realize I get into trouble there so I don't want to be in that situation. I want to be sure that uh, I can do this song uh, quite early on. So uh, uh, although I try to start from the easy parts I also try to start from the main most recognizable elements of the songs. And in this case it was the brass sound uh, which that the song starts with. So I took out my Oberham expander because I thought that that's probably the so type of brass sound that I'm looking for. And uh, quite quickly I found a preset called CS80 brass and that happens to be uh, exactly the type of sound that I was after. So this sound turned out to be quite spot on for what I needed. 
it, it seems to be a preset called CS80 Brass, but I'm not certain it's possible that I've edited this sound myself at some point. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know anymore. Uh, I, I kind of build up my libraries using presets and uh, edited presets and uh, also completely new sounds that I made. And after you work with something for 10 years, then you forget that uh, where did this come from in the first place. <laughs> anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, the, what matters is that it sounds great. <laughs> the next thing I did was going for the basses, I think. Uh, so what I... Uh, ended up using was my kind of two favorite suspects. <laughs> uh, I use a Korg Monopoly uh, for the bass, uh, for the low end, and, but then I also, on top of that, I have a Juno 60. So the Monopoly sounds like this. And the Juno 60 sounds like this. As you hear, I've cut out the base of the Juno 60, and for the Monopoly, uh, I have more of the base uh, in use. So the main kind of low end comes from the Monopoly, while the uh, Juno 60 uh, has this wide uh, chorus effect, uh, which really nicely kind of widens out and takes quite a lot of space here. So together, they sound like this. Quite nice. And then I went for the drums. And this time I used uh, mainly an analog rhythm. I have an analog rhythm Mark II that I uh, used for the song. And uh, the kick is from there. And I ended up using quite a lot of, of other things as well. I think, uh, let me see which ones are in use. I think the rim shot. Yeah, the rim shot section is in use. And then the toms. The toms, to be honest, are not that uh, interesting on this machine. Uh, I would have hoped that they would have more adjustment parameters, but you can't kind of get rid of the basic sound. There's little, very little harmonics in it. But for this particular tune, uh, when I heard the original, I was like, hmm, I bet that the analog rhythm would do that perfectly. And it turns out that it, it did. So uh, the toms are from the rhythm. And then I also used the, the hi-hat. Uh, and I think I used, uh, yeah, uh, this had a kind of a shortened symbol that I used at the bridge section. And uh, yeah, that's the main thing. Then I also use uh, Yomox uh, a snare drum. It has a beefier snare drum than the analog rhythm, I think. And uh, it uh, worked really nice for this song because I felt that the, we needed a really big 80s type of snare drum. Uh, let me show you the main settings for uh, the drums. I mean, mostly uh, I use... Uh, uh, if we are playing in real time, you can hear that all the effects are already there. Uh, because, yeah, I've already mixed the song. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just playing through the mixer right now. And uh, let's check out the snare drum, for instance. So for most of my sounds, most of my synthesizers, I barely use anything else than a bit equalization, compression perhaps, uh, and uh, a lot of delays and reverbs usually. But that's it. I, I don't hardly use any other effects, uh, except for the drums and especially the kick and snare. Uh, they, uh, I, I tend to use quite a lot of uh, effects for those. So let me show you my uh, 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 channel strip for uh, the snare and kick. So first, let's strip it back. So let's hear uh, what the snare drum sounds like without any processing at all. This is what it sounds like. So this is the clean sound, quite different from the, the, the final sound. So let's see how it's built up. Uh, first, I'm using a compressor to add some, some uh, beef to it, uh, you could say. It also lengthens the, the, the sound a bit. And uh, after that, I, I add some equalization. 
So uh, the EQ setting, I, I'm boosting a bit low and I'm cutting a bit in the middle. And then I'm also uh, boosting around uh, uh, 6,000 a bit to get out kind of uh, a bit more brighter sound. So next up, I'm adding an insert effect, uh, a wave designer. Uh, it adds transients to the signal. And in this particular case, it adds sustain. So I have a sustain on 16%. Now you can hear when I uh, put it to 100. So uh, what it does is uh, that it adds a bit length to it. The problem is that uh, with the Jomox Airbase snare, uh, this is the longest snare I can get. And it's like sometimes you would like to have a bit longer snare. So I have to do this artificially by adding, adding a bit uh, from the transient designer. But the problem with the transient designer, as you can hear, it boosts noise. So you can hear there is, it starts to be quite a lot of noise ringing also. So what I do then is I add a gate to get rid of the extra noise. And that works quite nicely. Uh, then the main ingredient, I would say, is the M200i mixer's gated reverb. So this is without the gated reverb, and this is with. So <laughs> it's like the reverb makes the sound. And then I add some, a bit of room reverb as well. So like kind of additional reverb. Uh, with the room reverb, I think, is from the internal reverb on yeah, it's the room reverb on my digital mixer's internal reverb. So yeah, that's the snare. Let's check out the kick. The kick sounds like this. You can see on this channel strip that I have EQ on, I have compression, and then I have an insert effect. No reverbs, no other send effects. Uh, but I have a really important element, and that is I have a multiband compressor on here as well. So let's listen to the kick without all of this. So it's not that beefy. <laughs> uh, so there is quite a lot of things that are done to it. First of all, I'm adding a, a, a basic compressor to uh, beef the signal up a bit. Here's without. Here's with it. Then I'm adding quite a lot of EQ as well. It takes quite a lot of the mid away to make room for other instruments. It, it, it boosts a bit around 50 hertz. And uh, then I also boost in quite a lot around two and a half kilohertz and uh, 6,000 uh, hertz. And uh, then the final and the most important element is a multiband compressor. So this is without the multiband compressor. And this is with. It really gives the final kind of uh, it makes it sound much more beefier and aggressive. So the multiband compressor is just the built-in uh, multiband compressor of the digital mixer. But it works really nicely in bringing out uh, uh, various uh, frequencies and you get a much more compact sound. In addition to those, I'm also using the TR-808. So I have the clap from the TR-808. My TR-808 is, by the way, uh, MIDI uh, uh, controllable. It's an old modification that the unit came with. So I even have uh, uh, velocity sensitivity, uh, but uh, depending on the instruments, uh, some velocity sensitivities are uh, really good, some are not so good. The clap has some. The cymbals have quite nice dynamics. Also, the, the rim search, I think it's the rim shot. The, the shaker has the worst, which would be nice to have a really good velocity sensitivity on a shaker, but this is, this is just like one off, <laughs> really. Uh, but I didn't use it, I think, in this song, uh, but I used these, uh, uh, these clubs. So then we have everything we need for the uh, main section. Uh, uh, let's listen to this, start with the, uh, with the drums. Uh, this is without snare. And then we add the snare. Or actually, let's add the bass first. And 
and ensnare. So this is the basic groove, and then we add the brass riff on top of that. So then we have the main section, and we can go on to other parts. Uh, the other parts have more or less the same elements, uh, but uh, they are a bit stripped back, so there might be a bit less uh, drums, slightly different rhythms, uh, slightly different bass lines, uh, but the kind of the basic uh, groove is the same, more or less, I would say. Uh, the main thing, or the first thing that we encounter is uh, the, uh, the melody in the, the first verse, so to say. And here I chose uh, uh, to go in a different direction than the original. So far, everything I've done is uh, uh, very close to the original, but I just couldn't stand the, the cheesy organ sound. The organ sound in the original, in the verse, is even cheesy for me. <laughs> And uh, so what I did was I took my Poly 61 and I found quite a nice sound for that one. So that's the basic melody sound that I chose for the verse. The second melody we encounter is in the second verse, and that's the vocoder. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a Roland VP330 vocoder, and uh, I used that one then for, for uh, the verse. And uh, this is what the vocoder sounds like. Really nice sound. The vocoder is MIDI controllable. So I think I did it so that I first recorded the MIDI notes and then I sang on top of that. And uh, I really tried to listen to what the vocoders sound like. So my vocals sound quite ugly. I and you forever, I run the power run. Me and you, you two make a word of surprise. So not the uh, most beautiful <laughs> vocals in the world, uh, but I, I, I just had to focus on articulating my words uh, as good as possible so that the vowels and the consonants come true, because that, uh, uh, that is what the, uh, the vocoder listens to. It basically just takes uh, uh, the, the, uh, the microphone, so everything that comes in from, uh, from, from the microphone to the vocoder uh, basically just kind of controls the frequency spectrum of the sound. And uh, so that's why the main thing is that you need to articulate properly. Uh, no need to think about uh, the pitch, because the pitch is dictated by what, the, uh, what, what MIDI notes, what notes you play on the keyboard on the vocoder. So let me put this uh, uh, vocoder to play, or I'm putting the, the recorded vocals to control the vocoder, and then I will uh, play on top of that. I am you forever, I run the power so, you see the point. I, I haven't done much to the sound, I would say. I, I have, uh, uh, I've just boosted quite a lot in the two and a half kilohertz region and also a high shelf from 3000 and up and that started to sound quite nice and i also have uh, uh, yeah I'm, I'm sending it out to a big sky uh, reverb uh, i'm also using the lexicon reverb but having the rack and i have uh, uh, a couple of delays uh, i think i even have three delays <laughs> is that true <laughs> oh my god then after the second verse, uh, th there is also uh, this bridge part uh, where we have a, a melody leading up again to the, to the main A part. And uh, this melody is this one. So that's the melody. And it consists of two different parts. So first I have a Marion Prosint in the rack that plays uh, this sound. 
So it's already the main sound, but on top of that, I'm adding uh, an Oberheim Matrix 1000 uh, string sound. So the sound is like a really slow attack, but I'm playing it fast. So this mainly adds space. But before that bridge, we have an arpeggio coming in. Okay, fortunately I don't need to play it, <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm progr I programmed it. And then I'm adding uh, uh, these... Uh, hits in the arpeggio. It's, this was in the original as well, so I took the idea from there. This arpeggio consists actually of two synths. One is the Alpha Juno 1, uh, which uh, uh, sounds like this. And then I'm adding uh, and duplicating the arpeggio, but without these chord hits, uh, with the Dave Smith Tetra. And that sounds like this. And these together then, So the two verses are repeated again, so when the vocal verse comes the second time, then I felt like, okay, now we really need some variation here. And uh, then I chose to add a new uh, arrangement to this, so I, I'm, I'm adding a string, a simple string arrangement to, to perhaps add a bit drama into the uh, second verse. And uh, uh, that sounds like this. Uh, That uh, uh, string section is uh, quite dynamically controlled with uh, uh, aftertouch. As you can see in the string part arrangement, there is a lot of uh, aftertouch data here. And what that aftertouch data does is uh, it uh, opens and closes the cutoff of the, uh, of the string sound. Now I have the aftertouch routed to uh, the mod wheel here. So when I move the mod wheel, the after uh, sorry, the cutoff of the Oberheim matrix goes up and down, and that way I can like play more dynamically. And then I just program it into the uh, or I record it into Cubase. And the good thing with working this way is that uh, I can just adjust the aftertouch data if I think that, oh, I went too bright there, I went too dark. If I don't want to record it, then I just can do small adjustments here in the curve later on. Then I think we only have one synth left, and, and that is the Syntact. Uh, it has uh, four uh, analog uh, engines, and uh, uh, I noticed that the analog engines have separate uh, uh, noise generators. So that means that you can, uh, you can uh, stereo spread them. So I've, I've done a, a noise hit like this. But uh, I, I copied that noise hit to the, and, and I spread this noise hit to the left. And then I have another one which comes from the right. And when you combine those two, you get a stereo image. And that is not normally possible with uh, older analog synths because they usually share the same noise generator. So if you try to, to do that uh, trick with some analog synths, you still only won't, will get the mono signal because they're using the same noise generator. So that's the basic arrangement. That's how I did the basic arrangement. Uh, the one thing we haven't still discussed is that I do have quite a lot of MIDI automation data as well. So I have all these lanes here that control the digital mixer. And uh, it's actually not that uh, uh, 
strange. It's mainly like uh, it's quite simple things. I'm just mainly using it for automating volume. In this case, I, I'm shutting the vocoder channel completely off when I'm not using it to avoid, to minimize hiss. That's probably the main thing I'm using the automation for. But then sometimes there might be uh, uh, some places where I want to kind of boost uh, uh, some certain notes, perhaps a fill in or something like that. And then I use the automation for that as well. So as I've shown you as a few examples here, the mixing is quite simple, uh, but uh, I have some side chaining uh, going on as well, especially in this type of more disco club type of songs. So uh, I'm feeding a bus uh, from the uh, kick drum. And the reason why I'm feeding a bus is that sometimes, uh, uh, not in this particular song, but in other songs, I might also want the sidechain to, to be activated by a snare hit and not only by the kick. So uh, I have, uh, I'm usually using a bus for, for, for the sidechain. And that this sidechain then drives uh, uh, several gates. So you can see this small, it's not a big effect, but you can see there is some small ducking happening on the J, uh, Juno 60, on the Monopoly. And uh, uh, let me see what, what else do I have on, uh, I see to have, seem to have some on the Oberheim uh, matrix strings, as, uh, on the uh, uh, expander brass as well. And uh, that's roughly it. So, so not much, but, but there is some. Let's see if we can even hear the difference. Uh, so let me take a short section and loop that and, and turn on and off the side chaining. So now we have it on. Now let's turn it off. Now back on. So it doesn't do much, but you can feel that there is a bit more kind of, uh, you get a bit this kind of rhythmic pumping, uh, which works really nice in these types of tracks. So this is in a nutshell how I arrange the tune. And then when everything is ready like this, uh, I mean, we are still just playing MIDI. Because it's basically readily mixed. Sometimes I have problems with MIDI timing in my system. And uh, for this particular tune, I couldn't get it as tight as I wanted. I mean, MIDI is an old protocol, but it also has something to do with that modern doors and the computers. Well, I mean, computers are designed for doing a lot of stuff, not only MIDI. And uh, uh, when you work with something like this, MIDI is an old protocol and it's quite slow, so you really need to optimize everything for MIDI. And uh, uh, what happens is that uh, you get some random um, uh, jitter it's called, so the MIDI notes aren't like exactly where you would like to have them, they jump a bit around. And uh, sometimes the jitter might be more and some days the jitter might be less. And when I was recording this, the, the jitter was too much, I felt I want to have it more tighter. So what I did, I, I basically exported the MIDI to my MPC sequencer. It has four MIDI outs, so I just pulled out the, the MIDI signals uh, and uh, split it up in my uh, uh, MIDI uh, eye connectivity MIDI interface boxes. And uh, that way I got it much more tighter than I managed to do with, uh, uh, with Cubase. So uh, that's one way around it's a bit uh, cumbersome, but uh, yeah, in this case it worked really nicely. When everything is ready like this, I could just record it as a stereo track. But I want to have some uh, possibilities later on, because usually uh, when I've been working on a track intensively, uh, it might be that I, I'm pers percepting things a bit differently than I, what I will do like two months later when I finish the track. So then I still want to have possibilities to, for instance, adjust the kick a bit, perhaps uh, reduce the bass a bit if needed, and or, or perhaps I might notice that, wait a minute, the lead is far too loud, uh, or something like that. So instead of recording any, everything to a stereo track, I record it into 10 tracks. So I recorded the kick separately, and uh, I have the snare separately recorded uh, without the reverb. And then I have the bass separately recorded, the Monopoly bass, uh, the lead. Actually, all the leads come in uh, to this lead track, so I, I probably have the vocoder here somewhere as well. Yeah, there it is. 
uh, without effects because uh, the effects come in on their all the return uh, effects uh, I record as their own stereo track. So here's only the effects. That way I have some control if I feel that okay this is, mix is now too washed out with effects and I can just lower the overall volume of the effects. And uh, then I also record the, uh, the rest of the scenes separately. Uh, and then uh, the whole rhythm section uh, except for the kick and snare, uh, uh, they are also on their own track. This way I can still do small adjustments to the mix, although the, the, the mix is ready more or less. Uh, but it, it helps a lot. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, some things that happen uh, when, when you use, I mean there is plenty of things that happens when you use analog synths. So each take is going to be a bit different. And even like each kick sound, each snare hit is going to sound different. Sometimes uh, uh, the variation can be so big that it's uh, not necessarily what you want. So what I do is I always record many takes. So as you can see here I have probably for this song, I think I probably recorded something like 10 takes, 10 to 15 takes, <laughs> so quite a lot. And what I did then, I for the for if, if you listen, if you solo the kick, listen to the kick. You can hear the sound var varies quite a lot. Uh, on its own it sounds okay, but then when you mix it with everything else, uh, there might be some things that start to stick out and some hits that stick out that you don't want to stick out. And this is because they are analog uh, instruments, so every time the, 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 uh, the, the sound is generated there is small like uh, differences in the sound. So it's not like a sample which is always exactly the same. So what I end up doing then, I usually... <laughs> <laughs> I put them next to each other, I put uh, several kick takes next to each other and then I pick uh, 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 the, the kick sounds which sounds closest to each other or, or mainly like uh, uh, there might be some, some places it might be okay, other places it might be more uh, of uh, more of an issue and in that uh, case then I, I use uh, kicks from different takes to get a more coherent kick sound. And uh, sometimes, uh, because there are analog scenes and because uh, uh, there is so much happening, there might be some odd clashes sound-wise. Uh, and that's why I also need several takes, because then I can, and then I can uh, 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 pick another take if, if some hit sounds really weird for some reason. Uh, then I can just uh, pick another take and take that instead. So that's why I record with quite a lot of takes. So there is quite some editing afterwards, although I, I, I basically have the song readily mixed, but I'm, I think I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I, I try to get it better, but I don't want to have it sterile. I want to keep it anyway, like sounding organic, which it does. Now for the album I did a separate sub-mixing step using an analog mixer and uh, you will see more of that in later videos but uh, I did the analog sub-mixing uh, last spring and at that time I didn't have time to make the arrangement for the extended version so then I decided to mix the single version digitally. Once the stems were recorded I did some small adjustments to them uh, on the lead I added an outboard uh, warm audio uh, tube equalizer uh, to add a bit mid and uh, for the for the bass I think I cut out quite a lot on the uh, uh, there was a peak around 130 I noticed there started to be quite a lot of bass build up in the song so I reduced that and uh, I did some small volume automation as well, uh, but that was roughly it. Then I ran it through uh, my mastering chain. So my mastering chains consist of an SSL EQ. Uh, I have a SSL native bus compressor and I have Ozone in the end. So the SSL I use for boosting a bit of uh, uh, low end and uh, a bit of high end and also uh, the area around the 3 kilohertz. So without it, it sounds like this. And with the EQ. So it adds a bit of, of, of uh, 
nice things <laughs> to the mix. After that, I'm running it through a bus compressor. I'm actually using the same settings uh, that I used on the analog bus compressor when I did the album, because for the album uh, master, I also run it through a warm audio bus compressor. And uh, let's see what that sounds like first without it. So it's not working much, but it's working some, and it's, it uh, kind of nicely evens out the signal. Uh, then for my uh, mastering chain, I'm not going to play this because my computer is uh, really at its limit here, as you can see. So it won't be able to play, play it right now. But uh, I'm using low-end focus, which kind of... Uh, uh, I'm, um, I'm able to add a bit more punch uh, in, the, in the kick drum. And uh, it kind of separates the kick drum a better route from the bass. And I, I really like what it does to it in this particular song. I'm adding a bit of EQ. I think I still uh, had a bit... Um, a lot of uh, uh, mud in the 200 uh, hertz area, and then I lowered, I think, about 2,000. I had boosted a bit too much on 2,000 on various instruments, so then I wanted to lower it. I uh, had some problems in the uh, 3 kilohertz region. There was some, uh, I think there was some ugliness there that I used the dynamic EQ to uh, get rid of. I'm also widening the, the mix uh, uh, quite uh, a bit. Uh, thanks to Modis for suggesting to me to use an area of around 450 hertz to 5 kilohertz for widening the synths. And that works really nicely. Uh, I'm also using a match EQ, uh, which was something that I found. I mean, if you, what you can do is you take a reference file, a master that you like, and then uh, it scans that master and then uh, you can choose to apply to uh, EQ, uh, kind of a corrective EQ, quite a broad EQ curve that you can apply so that it, it slightly makes your, your mix sound more like the reference mix. Uh, that is quite a nice tool to use. Then I even ended up using something called a master rebalance. So you can, uh, in Ozone you can actually choose if you want to, to kind of rebalance uh, the, the mix uh, and have it more, more focused on vocals, on bass or on drums. So uh, I did notice that it I thought this did quite, uh, quite, uh, quite good to my mix uh, by uh, focusing on the drums, slightly boost on that. Uh, worked quite nicely, I think. And then a multiband compressor in the end, and then a limiter. And, and that's the basic chain. But the chain grew quite long. <laughs> and this chain is different from what I use for the album. Uh, for this particular single, or in singles in general, uh, I mean, you don't, you don't have any other tracks to think about. You just want your track to stand out uh, among the billions of other tracks on, on, on the net. So, so I really try to make it sound as full uh, and, and uh, as... Uh, uh, punchy and, uh, and and nice, uh, most possible way, so to say. And also, I kind of boosted it to be quite loud because uh, uh, this is also going out on Beatport. So, uh, especially the extended version for DJs, uh, I, I need to boost uh, the, the 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 loudness quite a bit. But I'm still uh, uh, I'm pulling it back directly when I start to hear that it now it starts to break up. It doesn't sound so nice anymore. Then I'm pulling it back. I, I don't care then if it's not loud enough, but I have to think about, well, yeah, yeah, making it sound good. And, uh, but for the album version, I have like eight other tracks or nine other tracks that I need to think about, and I need to have these tracks balance with each other. So I used a different approach for the album tracks, and there will be more on that in, in, in later uh, episodes. So that was how I arranged, uh, mixed and recorded uh, my version of that song. Uh, this could probably be done a lot cheaper, better and easier <laughs> than this way. But I just wanted to show you uh, the way I work and hopefully you got some ideas and inspiration out of it. Uh, there will be more videos coming out soon, so make sure you subscribe to my channel. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for tuning in and see you again in a couple of weeks. <laughs>